And thank you for the invitation for being here. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a specialist in natural language processing and information retrieval. And that will come out here. So I'm not a lexicographer. And so excuse me if I say things that seem ridiculous. But I decided to, uh, since I do know about the web, I wanted to tell you some short things about the web. My talk will be in three parts. The first part is about the web. And then I'll talk about uh, the very large lexicon and what can be, and the presence of uh, the four parts. And then the presence of what language presence is really like on the web. And then I'll give a short case study in Zulu. OK, so first off, the web, uh, some people think that there's a list of pages on the web, of the web. And this is not the case. There's no list anywhere of people of pages on the web. People sometimes think, can I get my page removed from the web? And, and no, the web is a big network. And uh, when someone wants to index the web, they begin on one page. They find URLs on that page, and that's added to the list. And so there's always a list of pages to crawl or to crawl again. And that's how the web is done. So if you start in two different parts of the web, if Bing starts in one place and Google starts in another, they won't crawl the exact same pages. Another thing that you have to realize that the web is there's not a number of pages on the web. It's infinite in the sense that there are pages that can be created once you make the URL. And a simple example of that is calendars. There are pages which will generate a calendar for any date. So of course, that's infinite in time. Um, and a very important fact, maybe, is that no one indexes but a small part of the web. Uh, Google, in 2008, revealed that they have seen, not indexed, but seen 1 trillion, 1,000 billion URLs. And that's on their, their web blog. They say, we knew the web was big. Now, uh, Google used to publish on its home page how many pages it had in its index. And that they stopped that. Uh, about 2007, 2008. Uh, so we can only estimate how many pages are in the index of Google. And uh, so there's a site called uh, worldwidewebsize.com, which makes these estimates of how many pages are found inside Google and Bing and, uh, and the other remaining web servers. And they estimate that there's about 50 billion pages that are indexed by Google. So if you take the 1 trillion pages that Google has seen and the 50 billion pages that are in Google's index, there's 950 billion pages missing. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. Uh, a lot of those pages are, are junk. A lot of them are dynamically indexed, indexed pages which don't have any content like calendars on them. And, uh, but the main reason is a commercial reason. It's uh, people index the pages that are interesting to the public that they're addressing. Another web fact is that there are fewer and fewer independent web indexes. In the 90s, there were 20 or so uh, independent companies independently crawling the web. And there was, as often is in a market, a merging together of different companies. One company, one bigger company buying a smaller company. And now there are a few companies left. Uh, one of the last indexes that was bought up was uh, Yahoo's index. And now they use Bing's index. And so this is a problem in general of, of just as in, when, in the natural world, when you have biodiversity problems, because there are, two men, they're not, um, there are only a few species of tomatoes, for example. And if an illness fits, hits one of those species of tomatoes, then uh, it's good to have backup species. And uh, in the web world, if you have, you, we're reducing the information diversity that's available to people. If there's only a few indexes, there's only a few ways to get information. And that missing information is missing forever. So the current situation is there's only five major um, independent indexes now. There's Bing and Google, which have two independent crawls in, the North, in North America. In China, there's Baidu, which has an independent crawl. Yandex in Russia, and uh, Exilead uh, is the last remaining asterisk-type um, defender of Europe. Um, 
And our index is a bit smaller. There's about 16 billion pages in it. But it's the same level as the other ones. OK, so um, another important thing to understand is the content in an index is not the web. Google does not index the entire web. As we saw, there are 950 billion pages missing. So uh, what's in the index? Well, each company decides what they want to have in it. For example, Baidu in China will have many more Chinese pages than English pages, although there are still billions and billions of English pages. It, it has hundreds of billions or tens of billions of Chinese pages. So uh, each company de decides what language to use. For example, in Exilis Index, there's uh, predominantly French pages, English pages, and then hundreds of millions of other languages. But, but that's small compared to the billions. You can also decide what country you want to index. And of course, there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence be between countries and languages. And then uh, there's the depth of a site. A site is a first part of the URL that you find in the header of a web page. And that site can go very deep. And so each um, there's some automatic judgment of the importance of a site. And according to importance, you'll go deeper or, or less deep in a site. So not everything that's, that's available on the web that even you can see uh, once you get to a site is going to be in an index. And another limit is page length. Some pages, some, a web page can be millions or billions of characters. And there's some limit in how, how far that will be indexed um, by a search engine. And then another parameter important is how often that page is refreshed. For example, we'll refresh news sites every 15 minutes. But a site that has a date in it and maybe the word archive will be indexed once every two years. So the content of the index is a series of commercial uh, decisions. OK, and now getting to something important for uh, web crawling for lexicographic use. The number of results that's given for a page is often just an estimate, and sometimes a wild estimate. Uh, John Veronis remarked this, uh, late John Veronis, who unfortunately died this summer. Uh, he was one of the first persons to study the fact that the w web counts given by Google were not exactly what was found in the site. And one explanation of this would be that uh, they're using a smaller data database in order to give a, a quick answer. For, so for example, if you ask A and B as a query, they'll ask that question A and B on a small site. I think I have a pointer here somewhere. Yeah. And then uh, for that small site, for example, if it gives 3,000 pages here, uh, they know the scale of the small site with respect to how many pages they really have, and they make some estimate of how many times this item appears in all the pages. So that's why you happen to have 0, 0, 0 after as the last three numbers of the results, because it's an estimation. Um, Exilead, which is not a very commercial database, actually gives the exact counts. And that's why I used Exilead's uh, counts in what follows. OK, so. Um, Another important fact to know is that even though you might, it might say there's 15, billion pages, 15 million pages about a certain topic, you can't get those 15 million pages back. For example, here's a, an example. I enter the word Maya, which is a, a, a language organization in Paris. And it says that there are 6 million pages for this. But if you click, keep clicking through uh, Google, you only get up to 841 pages. So uh, you don't even get to the 1,000 limit that they, that they have, because they say most of the pages are replications of what's seen before. So between 6 million and 812, uh, there's, a, there's a great difference. So you can't get 6 million examples of a word just using uh, an index like Google or Exile. OK, that's some web facts I wanted to clear up, because I'm going to I'll refer to some of these uh, during the rest of the talk. So the things to remember is only a small part of the web is indexed. The web is bigger out there. There are fewer and fewer indexes available. Uh, what is indexed by Google or Yahoo or Bing, uh, Google or Bing, I'm sorry, or Baidu, is a, a strategic choice. 
Um, most people think that something like Google is a public service. It's not a public service. It's an advertising company, which makes 97% of its income from advertising. And so those, that income dictates what choices it's going to provide as a service. OK, web counts are not reliable, uh, especially when they're very small. And most of the pages on the web index can't be fetched by a user. So those are all uh, things that you should keep in mind. OK. Now I'll get to uh, the bulk of my talk. Um, I told you I'm not a lexicographer, but here's what I, the working definition I use of lexicography. So uh, explaining what words mean uh, and how they're used. This may leave out a lot of things you find here uh, near and dear. And then e-lexicography is when that function is plugged in somewhere, plugged into a computer or, or into the internet. OK, and this is, uh, here's a map from the 15th century and then a map uh, from Google Maps. And what we're trying to do with, lex I think what you're trying to do with lexicography is move from the first map to, to the second map, where you can have much more information when you want to. You can uh, look at information from farther away or close up. And this is um, the purpose of things like um, making maps uh, of words or sketches of words. So uh, these word maps or sketches, um, I, I started working on something similar to, to what Adam is doing, uh, um, word sketches. Um, there was a project decide with Ulrich uh, Hyde uh, in, in the 1990s, which was built, used a corpus to find information about, about how words were used. And here we were dealing with, uh, we were dealing with, um, Act, um, act verb acts, and so we take something like complement, and we'd find out how it was used as a noun and how it was used as a verb, and what patterns it appeared in, and so we find the things like, uh, and these all had had values of with respect to a certain um, corpus. So we were using low-level parsing to extract the patterns in which this word appeared, and then exposing this in what was called the decide lexicon. And which consisted of a few hundred uh, words. So if you have complement, you have complement, uh, what uh, the verb subcategorization patterns that appeared in down here. These are the typical uses of it. Uh, here are how it's used with this um, support verb pay. And, um, and we did this over a number of words. Um, also, at the same time, I was, I was working in information retrieval, and at that time, one of the big problems was that people use very short queries in information retrieval, for example, one word queries. So uh, using the same technique um, of low level parsing, um, we decided we could use this to palliate one word queries. So if someone used one word, you, you'd say, OK, you use this word. Here's how this word is used in conjunction with other words in the, uh, in the underlying text. So here's an example with the verb uh, research. So, uh, all this information is extracted using low-level parsing, because I was working in Xerox at the time, which had a wide variety of tools for low-level parsing. And so there's types of research, like market research and recent research and uh, scientific research and social research. So those are all noun phases in which research is, is ahead. And then there's research things. So there's research projects, programs, centers. These are all in actually uh, descending order of frequency in the, in the database. And so these are uh, noun phases when research is the modifier. And then uh, when research is used as a verb, uh, where there was a, uh, information of things one can research. So research a book, research somebody, research development or a project. That's when that's the direct object. So these were all glosses of the syntactic categories that were extracted. Uh, there was a named research when you had a uh, research uh, noun phrase that had a proper name in it. Um, and then things one does to research. This is when research is a direct object, et cetera. So these tables were produced uh, automatically from the corpus using low level parsing. And uh, they weren't, it wasn't produced for lexicographers, it was produced for people who were searching uh, the web. OK, so at that time, I thought we should have actually this for all languages. 
and not just for the web, but for any type of purpose. So we get into lexicography. So at that time, at the end of the 1990s, I started talking about very large lexicons. So uh, for each word in language, you extract all the web pages containing that word, then all the syntactic relations from that word, and all the concepts containing the word, and all the people, places, and things found around the word. So you're getting a lot of information about how that word's used in what context. And since you have the frequency, this is a weighted model of that word in the whole, um, in the whole web. And then uh, here I use the word concept when I mean a multi-word expression, so that each concept containing the word is a, a, a multi-word expression or actually a, a noun when it's a syntactic uh, relation when it's found with that word in it. And then I want to do the same thing for uh, all the multi-word expressions and then for all each language. So that was the goal. And uh, I, then I left the Xerox, and I wasn't able to do it until a few years later, and only for one language. And in between time, uh, Adam started doing it for a number of languages uh, using the same type of word sketch idea. So here is uh, the only one difference between word sketch and this approach is this is uh, web oriented. So you go out and use the lexicon to uh, access the web. And then the corpus is derived from all the words that uh, are found on the web. So it's not a clean corpus. OK, so you crawl the web. Uh, you need a language identifier, which is very easy technology to implement using sequences of letters. Uh, and then I thought we'd add in the domain classifier so you could make lexicons for each domain. And then you extract from that all the uh, syntactic information you find and put that into a very large lexicon. So um, here's uh, how I did this for French. I started with all the words of the French language. There are spell checking dictionaries which you can decompile and generate all the word forms in it. So I had the full lexicon, and then I used that lexicon to go and each one of those words was sent off as a query to the web to find all the web, at least a thousand uh, web pages, or a maximum of a thousand web pages that had that word in it. So um, I took the lexicon, and then I went out and actively searched web pages for each word in the lexicon. And here, not the lexicon, the full form lexicon. So that took a number of months, because you just can't send off 400,000 queries in one day. And in order to decide whether uh, these are French words or not, I used the idea of using anchor words. For example, if you take the word relations, which can be in French or English, uh, if you put these words on it and specify that you want a web page with relations and, and these French words, a, que, le, la, pour, and le, then you're likely to get back French pages rather than English pages. And if you specify that you want the, with, and, and of, uh, then you're likely to get back English pages. And you can test this on a, on a large corpus and find out that actually 80% of French text contain these anchor words, and 90% of English text contain these anchor words. So that's a good thing. You don't get all the pages, but you get a, a, it's a cheap and, and dirty way to get pages uh, in a certain language, so that anchor word technique. So I did that for 400,000 French forms. Um, there's a, a computer command, wget, which allows you to get web pages and then treat them. There's another one called links, which is better for just pure text. And when I did this for 400 French forms, getting up to 100 URLs for each word, uh, that gave me 5 million unique URLs, which cover the whole French lexicon. So that was very important to cover for me, for, to cover all the uh, words in the language. And here are some examples of the frequency of the pages. This was back in the, in the mid-2000s. Uh, so you have 842 pages that contain Helicicruture, which is a, uh, when you raise snails. Uh, and some of the other words were very rare, had very few web pages at the time. Uh, for example, this one here, seven, I just looked this up last night on, this is a plural form of, of raising snails. Um, and now I think there's about 70 pages on Google for this word with those anchor terms. OK, and that. Um, so once you get back all the pages, then you apply a low uh, a dependency parser technique. 
and you extract all the, all the different relations you want to put into the large lexicon. So here's, here's an example of a sentence you'd find on, the, uh, on one of those pages. And here's the English translation of that sentence. So from this, you, you can extract all the lemmas if you have uh, a lemmatizer. You can extract the dependency relationships and the compounds. So here you have a uh, spigot angle, uh, which is extracted as a compound or a concept or a multi-word expression. And then for each one of those words or multi-word expressions, you have all the words that are in the same window of words around it. And then um, here's another example using airplane, uh, in which you had many more pages. You could extract all the, uh, the verb patterns in which airplane appears with the frequencies. This information, as Ryan said, is useful in a number of natural language processing tasks. It's not maybe useful that useful to a human that wants to go in and find it, but for natural language processing, it's useful to have these frequencies, of course. Okay, and then you find also all the, the phrases in which you have airplane as a modifier, airplane ticket, airplane accident, with their relative frequencies. You find all the uh, phrases in which airplane is a head name, so commercial plane, combat plane, military plane, and you can find all the words in the neighborhood just around windows of that word, and then they're converted in mutual information. Now, I saw during the last few days that you, many of, these, of this type of information is included on, um, on the websites of, of any dictionary now. Um, so this is not new to any of you. But it does give a large view of, of what, what plane is. Um, so you have the neighborhood words uh, with the mutual information, and then all this. And then um, what I produced for French is still available on the web, even though I had left that, that research center five years ago. And so you can type in a word like uh, lexicographer, and you get all the different forms of lexicographer in French. So you have these are French lexicographer, Quebec um, head lexicographer, the, um, the verbs and the and this, subjects that use lexicographer. And here on this website, I, if you scroll over a word like um, an activity of lexicography, you have a little window in which you say, here, this is just where I hid the count. So this count appeared 14 times, and there's a mutual information in it, and that mutual information changes aside, like in a word cloud, which you've seen. And also, I left uh, a link toward pages uh, where this information was extracted from. So one of the uh, terms was uh, uh, celebrated lexicographer. And if you click on celebrated in that website, you go to the page in which that information was extracted. Now, I did this five years ago. And actually, most of those links are dead now because the half-life of a web page is probably something like, like a year. So if you take URLs, half of them are going to be dead within a year. And then over two years, uh, a quarter of them will be still alive. OK, so um, but you can play with that if you want, if you want to see. Then so if any of the words in, in the lexicalization, these are still available. Um, so there's all the, so this is, this is uh, the word sketch using this information extracted from the web. So this is what I wanted to do for every language on the web. And now I'll get to the uh, uh, third part of my talk, which is how is this possible to do for every language on the web? This is what I had in case it didn't work. OK, so what do you need to make this word map or word sketch? This is an icon that you see on the internet for first world problems, because Actually, making a word sketch is a first world problem. Um, so you need a list of the words for the languages. And you need a list of all the surface forms of those words, because you want to go out and access all the pages that contain all the surface forms of the word and bring them back. And uh, you need a list of the common words to anchor the text into the language. Uh, you need a list of common words, of course, which is specific to that language. 
you need the uh, list of the surface uh, lemma forms because you need all that information to normalize the text. Uh, you need a language identifier, a sentence and word segmenter, and then a dependence, dependency parser. So uh, if you want to do this for all the languages, uh, what about uh, under-resourced language, which is, of course, the title of my talk? Well, our goal is to do it for the 7,000 languages that are considered as living languages. Um, so that's the goal. And how possible is that to do? Well, um, if we just take European languages, there was a, a European prog uh, program called Metanet, which wanted to analyze what, in, what type of linguistic resources, natural language processing resources, and lexical resources existed for each one of the European languages. So um, they made a big matrix of, of languages and, and information. So there's corpus, lexicons, ontology, grammar models, terminology, things down databases of, of names or corpus of speech. And they made this big um, table that's published on this website. If you look up MetaNet, you can find this information for the European languages. And what they found, they classified the languages between languages which had a good coverage and languages which had a poor coverage, and just the 23 European languages uh, that they considered. So the first cluster was excellent, in which there were technologies that exist, uh, that are widespread, they're available, uh, they have all the linguistic phenomena that you want to use, and you can do natural language processing right now with, uh, for that language. And in that cluster, we have uh, uh, no languages. So excellent language report uh, doesn't exist for any language. And then in the cluster two, you have uh, things where you have not everything, but you have a wide variety. And of course, the only language in there is English. And then it goes downhill from there. And then uh, you have, on the far side, you have uh, language in which there might be just drawing board level prototypes or rudimentary prototypes. And there's major gaps in everything you need to do language processing. And there you have uh, things like uh, Croatian, Estonian, Icelandic, Irish, etc. I think this was uh, in the beginning and this is the end. And so some of the languages might have gotten more uh, information over the last five years. But so even in uh, in Europe, in European languages, there's lots of languages for which we don't have just rudimentary resources. There was also a similar work done in the US uh, by Tides, in which they studied 314 languages and they, found, they studied which uh, resources existed for each language, like newspapers, Bibles, dictionaries, morphological analyzers, and uh, they made a big table of, of these languages. The first one just said, whether the language is written or not. So that's why there's a lot of green here. And then there are very few languages which even have newspapers in that language. Uh, this was done a few years ago, but it's also another resource. And this point is some of the resources that they specify in the table. So if we want to do this uh, word map or word sketch for all the languages in the world, well, we're not going to have a dependency parser, at least for those languages. So let's take this list, which goes from more, less complicated to more complicated, and start on the other side. So forget about dependency parser and, and lemmas, forms. Let's just say, do we have a list of the words in the language? Can we find a list of the words in the language on the internet? And here's some place where you can get uh, words for a language, from uh, newspapers, uh, from dictionaries, from Bibles, from spell checkers, Wikipedia, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And, and then I'll talk about Krubadan later. So uh, here's, here's my bear. Um, you might have eaten the bear last night. At our table, we had discussions whether it was really bear because it was so tender. Um, but anyway, the bear, at some times in the bear's life, uh, they, they have a plethora of food. 
And actually, when a bear is eating salmon, I just found this on some documentary, uh, they, there's so many salmon there that to eat that they don't even eat the meat. They just eat the skin because the skin has the most fat in it. So they'll peel off the skin of the, of the salmon and throw the meat away because there's just so much. And this, in the, to relate this to the talk, this is when you have news being produced in a language, you have the same situation. You have so much text that you can just take whatever you want out of it. And so uh, when you have a new online news site, you're being, new text is being produced all the time. You can update words. You can have historical uh, uh, images of words. Um, but what's the situation? Well, Google News has 73 editions, and they correspond to about 26 to 27 languages. I say 26 or 27 because 8 is Flemish and 9th is Dutch, and so if you want to consider them as the same language. Um, so for these 27 languages, you have, you're the bear and you have the salmon, and the, this is the salmon being produced. And so if you're a, a bear lexicographer for these languages, you're in good shape. There's also another site uh, which is mentioned. This is a project which... Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know about, but it's another uh, joint research uh, center project from the European Union. It's called the European Media Monitor, EMM. And they actually do the same thing as Google News, but actually in a much deeper level for lexicography. They have, uh, in 21 languages, they're extracting news articles. They align them across languages. They extract proper names, and they align those names across languages. So there's a great database of how someone's name is written in all the different scripts in the world and all the different variations. So this is something that, which is also a very rich resource for uh, lexicography or at least natural language processing work. But again, there's only 21 languages. So if we look at our goal of 7,000 languages, we have, in news, we're down to, we have 27. Okay, well, let's look at Bibles. Now, Bibles, well, you can find a lot of Bibles. The Jehovah, Jehovah Witnesses and a number of other religious groups want to distribute Bibles, and they've done this in a number of languages. So at the jehovahwitnesses.org site, you can find 65 Bible in different languages, 65 different languages. Some of these Bibles are incomplete. Sometimes they only have... Uh, the New Testament, and they don't have, or they have one or two books. But there's 65 languages there. Uh, just to give an idea of how useful a Bible is, uh, the King James Bible contains 12,000 different words, including all the names in it. And if you take a, a, a list of English words you can find on the Internet, uh, there's a, a file, actually, in all the Unix files has English words in it, that contains 460,000 words. This is used to uh, break passwords in case you want to know. Uh, about 9,000 of those King James Bible words are found in that list. So you're actually only covering about 4% of the English vocabulary. So Bibles only give you a very small coverage of the vocabulary, but they actually give you a very good source for the stop words, which you can use as anchors. So here's a list of uh, the and of to that. And stop words have a very good uh, use in natural language processing because stop words are the small function words, I'm sorry, uh, and because they have a relative frequency which is common in a text. So if you just know the frequency of the stop words, you can guess how big the text is. And I've used that in the past to estimate how much language is available for uh, a given language in an index in a, in a web search engine. Okay, so Bibles were up to 65 languages. Uh, so that's 1% of the languages that we want to cover. Okay, but how about dictionaries? Dictionaries is, is when you're going to, someone has always pack, already packaged up the work you want. So here, you're going to a shopping center and you're going to pick out the dictionary you want. Um, there's EU resources, of course, they're limited to the 23 languages in Europe. Uh, there are a number of places on the web where you can get free dictionaries that you can use for natural language processing. So one of them is dicks.info. There's also Word Gumbo. And these generally have about 60 dictionaries. And they're bilingual dictionaries. 
So I'll use one of these for Zulu later on. And then, of course, there's Wiktionary, which people have mentioned often during this week. In Wiktionary, there are 1,000, no, how many? Uh, there's 1,000 languages. But if you actually limit yourself to those languages which have 1,000 words or more, then there are 105. And the other ones only have less than 1,000 words in it. And Tagalog is, is right there at the cutoff point. That's why I do that yesterday. OK, so if we go to dictionaries, we can have 105, we're dictionary, we can have 105 uh, languages where we have just the words. We're just looking for the words in a language. Sources for that. So there's 105. But we can hope the dictionary will keep on growing. OK, and there's also um, spell checkers. Now, spell checkers is a number of different forms of spell checkers. There was A spell, P spell, I spell, Hun spell from Hungarian, because the Hungarians work a lot on natural language processing. And a lot of these informations contain all the data that you can use. Uh, for example, A spell has 91 languages in it. And of course, you can't read this, but if you look up A spell, uh, you'll find a list of these languages. And you can download this information for each one of the language. And the information is a list of, often it's, it's presented as a list of root forms and then modification of those root forms, which would generate all the legal words in the language. And uh, there's about 91 of them that you can use. So those can be, they're useful because they can produce all the word forms, um, but there's only 91 out of our 7,000. And how about Wikipedia? There's more uh, Wikipedia sites than on Wiktionary. There are 242 languages which are active. Uh, there's all the statistics is available on the Wiki, Wikimedia sites. And, um, and they break down into the rich languages and the poor languages. So the rich languages have millions of articles. And then you have second rich languages which have hundreds of thousands of articles. And then you have some languages which are active. They have 10,000 articles. And then you have a bunch of languages which have 1,000 articles or less. So if we take those that are uh, just active, then we have 242 languages. And here are the number of articles. These are the article, the languages, uh, the number of pages that we have for each language. So Danish has 11,000 pages. So at, in the round table last night, we said, how can money be used? We should, uh, each country should actually have a, a national pride in having their information present in Wikipedia and in Wiktionary. And that would be money well spent rather than hiring, hiring lexicographers uh, to make a dictionary that appears in 30 years. So you stimulate the people to fill up this information. It would also give us a lot of language to work with. Uh, and these are uh, languages which aren't in the 242, which have articles, but which people don't edit. Well, there have been a few touches. So there's 279. No, 242, I'm sorry. And then there's a Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there's 400 versions of this on the, uh, on the UN website. <coughs> Unfortunately, only 279 are available as text. And there's lots of uh, images that are in PDF. And they're just they're photos of um, this typeset uh, language. So since they're photos, they can't be exploited uh, yet in by a computer. The average length of this is, a, is 130 words. This also can give you, uh, so there's about 500, an average, there's 500 different words in this universal declaration. And, but they give you also an idea of what the stop words are. So if you use this to find the anchor words, you can find the anchor words for uh, these 279 languages. And you can find the common words that appear many times in the text and then use those as the anchor words uh, if you want to crawl the web. OK, so that's 279. And then uh, there's Krubadan. 
Kubadon for all you Irish speakers. You know what it means, uh, and I didn't. Uh, but it means to crawl, and it means to crawl in a rather clumsy way. Uh, it comes from the word for a paw, uh, like an animal's hand in, in Irish. And it's, it was a project done by Kevin Scannell, who's trying to promote the Irish language. But he's actually done a lot of work over the last decade trying to find resources for all the minority languages on the web. Uh, he is in the University of St. Louis in the US. And uh, he produced, he crawled all the, using all the resources I mentioned, he tried to crawl all the languages that were possible to crawl on the web using this Krubadan uh, method. So up until now, he has now information on a thousand uh, languages. Uh, so, but a lot of them only have one document, or two documents. So the 678 languages which, which have four or more documents. And then there's another 48 that have four, 144 with three documents on the web. And he's really tried to find these documents. I mean, it's not as if it's, uh, this was a one-pass thing. So he's had people working, graduate students working on it. And, um, and then many languages have no documents on them. So there's 89 with no documents. So there's only 1,000 languages that have at least one document on the web. Uh, he's produced trigrams for all the languages that he found, which you can download at this website and nltkeygoogle.com, which is also pointed if I'm on his website. And so you can find uh, trigrams of letters for all these languages, all these 450 languages uh, that he's found enough text for. So this is useful if you want to do a language identifier. Okay, in 2007, he said um, that at that time he only found 355 languages which had, uh, he found corpus for 460 languages, but 355 had a very limited web presence. So you have a very small amount of text. So if you want to go to the original problem of making a large word sketch or a large map of how these words are used in a language, you can't do it. You can do it for the rich languages. You can't do it for the poor languages using the web. Uh, so you can get up to about 447 using these techniques. Uh, this is a real effort for finding everything you can about the language. And we're short for 6,000 languages. Now, this might be good news because, I mean, uh, that there's a lot of work for lexicographers. There's 6,000 languages in which you have to describe just the basic elements of what the language is. But it's hard work because you can't do it automatically. OK, so I tried to do something then for uh, undersourced re language uh, Zulu. Now, um, it's surprising that Zulu is an under-resourced language because there's 16 million, or there's 10, I thought there was six, yeah, there's six, 15, 16 million speakers of Zulu as an L2 language. And there's 10 million in South Africa. So 10 million people, it's, it's a written language. You would think that there would be uh, resources for this to make a, a, a word sketch or a word map. And there's a universal declaration of rights of man. So you can use these techniques to uh, find out the common words. I don't know any Zulu, but I, I just know that N-O-M-A is one. And I think uh, Yumuntu is person, because it's a word that appears very often. Um, there's one resource I could find. I found one dictionary online at the word gumbo for English to Zulu. It contains 821 unique words of Zulu. I took Wikipedia, the Zulu Wikipedia, which has 860 articles. Unfortunately, 260 of them are stubs. That means it's just one line with the word stub in it. Uh, there are a number of articles which are in, in different languages, either in Dutch or in English, so they're in the Zulu uh, Wikipedia, which I tagged. So hopefully they will be removed. Uh, that's a part of spamming that appears anywhere. Anytime you have an open site, as you know, if you have an open dictionary site, 
people will spam it. Okay, well, I took the, those sites and I eliminated the ones with English and Dutch, and then, um, or Afrikaans. And then this gives 4,000 distinct word forms for Zulu. And you have the numbers on them. And 107 of those words were in my 800 word dictionary. So this, I'm looking to get just the basic words of Zulu. Uh, fortunately, there's a Hanspel spell checker for Zulu, which will generate six million words, four word forms of Zulu. It's a compound language, so the, lots of the, <coughs> this will add what, what we call prepositions in English to all the words. Out of these six million forms, 2,000 of them were found in the Wikipedia from Zulu out of the 4,000 different words. And so I took uh, the base forms because these, these spell checkers are base forms and then rules to generate all the different forms. And I looked them up using Exilead search. And as an anchor tech, I used uh, Noma, I guess it means or, and Cunha, which means one. And so I, I had a sample query. I'd look up the word abavodwa and then add, make sure that it has these two words in the text. And so uh, that was 100,000 queries of this form with the word and these two anchor words. And then uh, 25,000 of those queries gave results. So I found 25,000 pages with one of those words on. If you take all the URLs, there are only 240 unique URLs. So lots of them were on the same page. If you go fetch all those URLs, you get back 80,000 words of Zulu and 12,000 different words um, of Zulu. Uh, that didn't seem very much for a language of 16 million people. So then I, I, I decided to be smarter and just restrict the sites to South Africa because that's where most of the texts are found. And I didn't use two anchor words, but just one, Noma. Uh, which means or, and all the words. So this the same number of queries, but now I have site ZA for South Africa, and then one anchor word, and then this word changes for the 100,000 times. So this gives um, more URLs, and I brought back all those, and also use the PDFs, because lots of the text is in PDF now. And this gives me more words. It could be 996,000 nine, different words, of which a third of those are found on Hanspel. So a third of those are attested words uh, you know, out of the 6 million words. And 4,000 of those appear 10 times or more. So this is a little more hefty. And this allows you to do things like uh, to rank them how often the words appear, from which you can use this frequency information to find mutual information. And then you can make a small word sketch of the words. So here's a word. I have no what I would do what it means. Do we have any Zulu speakers in here? Does anybody know what Zamfakati means? Because I also didn't find that in any online dictionary. Anyway, it's a rather common word. And you can create the keyword and context of this using this website. Do you know what it means? OK. <laughs> but it could just be a long function word. Inside. OK. Uh, I, I tried to look it up, and I thought it might mean milestone, because it's, it often appears on the OK. And then here's the words with this. These are the uh, n-grams, two-word things, where it appears on the left. Here's the ones where it appears on the right with their frequencies. These are the words that appear most often around it in current occurrence. And this is converted into mutual information. So this is a, a small word sketch of, of this uh, Zulu word. And this is about as far as I could get with uh, limited time and, and what's available on the, on the internet. 
Now, on one hand, it would be nice to have this for even have and have this, if, I suppose, if you worked on Zudo. And it isn't available on the internet, and it could be done automatically. All the steps are automatic. And this can be done for the languages like uh, Zulu, but still it's poor, as you see. So um, this is, uh, a, where is it? So we have, to sum up for Zulu, we have 16 million speakers. There's 860 Wikipedia articles. There's 7 million potential word forms. And we only attest 40,000 of those word forms on the web. And out of those 40,000 word forms, only 5,000 appear 10 times or more. So if you want to build up some type of automatic cloud or sketch of those words, it's a small percentage of the language that you can, that you can find. So though it's a big country, you have little information on the web. But you do have information. So this is actually one of the, one of the luckier languages. So uh, to conclude with all this, uh, the ones, things I want to have you retain from this is although I, 10 years ago when I, I came here, I, I gave this talk about, well, we need lexicographers in the year, not here, but in your lex, well, we need lexicographers in the year 3000. And I was very optimistic because I was dealing with English. And in English, you have so much information, you can do so many things automatically that uh, it looked like you could do anything. And people generally have the idea that on the internet, you have everything. Ah, you don't. You have lots of stuff for English and then lots of stuff for the European languages. But it's, it sort of follows and mems the same model as economic development of a country. So the rich countries have a lot and the poor countries have nothing. Um, I want you also to retain the fact that, that Google and Bing and the other ones don't index the whole web. So that's a room for hope. Maybe in those 900, 900 billion pages that aren't indexed, there is the information we need. And you can actually start making a Zulu web crawler. And there have been European projects that have tried to crawl just specific language, not using the information in Google, but some seed set of URLs, and then try to make your own crawler, crawler specific to a certain country or a certain language. And so that can be done, but it's expensive. Uh, it's not expensive. It just takes effort. So that, that gives hope. But generally, Web sources are very poor for poor languages, and I find that depressing. So uh, in conclusion, I, I used to believe the web was like this, where you just had to put your hand in and pick out what you wanted from the web. But actually, the web is more like this desert for the 6,000 languages which people use and which are not present on the web. You have very little to go on. And so it's a dry, arid language, dry, arid world. Oops. There are, there is one, I mean, there are people that are trying to correct this problem. Uh, there are two projects which have joined together, Rosetta Project and Pandex, which are trying to add all the information for these under-resourced languages by hand. And they've joined together in this thing called uh, endanger, endangeredlanguages.org. Uh, uh, but if you go to the Rosetta Project or Pandex, you can get to them, even if you can't read it here. And they're trying to crowdsource these languages, uh, making specific appeals to the people who speak those languages to add on this information. So there is hope. There is hope if there's a political awareness that these languages should be saved and can be saved, and that the people that speak those languages are involved in this saving process. OK, so that's all I had to say today. Thanks. Thank you very much for this very, very interesting talk. There is definitely need for cooperation with AfroLex and AsiaLex so that not only European countries would be involved, so that all languages would be covered and we all would move in the same direction concerning natural language processing and other things. And we have only one minute for one question, please. <laughs> yes, Istok. Five minutes? 
five? Okay. okay. We have five. Then we are doing good. Ask well. away. So please, questions. Yes. Um, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, uh, as I work with a number of minority languages, well, not minority languages in South Africa, but the majority languages in South Africa, um, it's interesting to see the way that you approach this issue. Um, we've approached it a completely different way, mainly a manual way. We OCR texts. Yes, we do have corpora for Isiziru, Isikosa, uh, Northern Sutu, and so on, and just do other people in the room. Um, but we do a lot of work that's manual, and we have made a bilingual Isiziru dictionary in the last three years, and we're busy working on another Nguni language. So the, the dictionaries are not available online, they're print. Hmm. So I think for a number of under resourced languages, print may be the way that people need to go. Or to make those printed resources available online. Because if you want to do, and there's a number of uses of it, like in information retrieval, that you need uh, an electronic version of it. Um, and a simple thing is if you want to find different word forms using one word form, then you need that information available online in a search engine. So I, that, Thank you for the information, and I hope that those are put online rapidly. No, they won't be. Maybe they will be. Okay. Yes, please. Adam. Which, which um, search engine did you use for all this work? I used Exalead. Isn't that a big risk that Exalead's um, index is just... 10% the size of Google, and you would have got 10 times more if you'd used Google. Uh, that's possible. I did look some, uh, up some of the queries, the same queries to find the frequency of the same queries on Google, and they were about twice as much on Google. So, but they weren't like 100 times more or 1,000 times more. So that... Uh, did, you, did you also compare Bing? No, I didn't. We're, I'd, I've heard anecdotally that you can get much better results for this kind of thing from, for Google than from Bing, and at the moment we use Bing in <coughs> okay. on the... So I'm, I'm quite surprised that, you're, that you only found a difference of a factor of two, and it, and it's, yeah, it, it, would, it could make quite a... I mean, it could well, make I quite a big difference. I only tested a few cases, so yeah. uh, mm. it was anecdotal. Um, but that might give you more information, and you could do it better. But then Zulu is actually up among the high resource languages compared to the other ones. As we've seen there, I mean, even dictionaries and people working on it. But I do agree that with what Megan said, that there has to be manual work for these other languages. I mean, what you can get off the internet is very small. So I hear yeah. a question. Just one moment. I just wonder if we take into account, for example, um, Lars Barines from the University of Gothenburg. He was telling about that there are more than 7,000 languages. Half of them have uh, um, about 7,000 speakers, which is a village, actually. Mm. And 18% uh, of them have... Uh, no more than 100,000 speakers, which is a small town, mm -hmm. and only 20% are so-called uh, large languages. And every two weeks dies uh, the last speaker of a language. Uh, so that is and I, I, and I, Yeah, and um, I support your idea completely, but do you think it is really possible to take care of all of them Aren't we chase, chasing the sun, actually? Aren't we changing the what? The sun. Oh, I see. Uh, <laughs> well, in the Ethnautical website, they, they actually cover this. They say that there are 
682 languages which are institutional. And those are the ones which we should say if, in the beginning, of course, because these are some things being used by a large society or an institution. And then uh, the, they have 900 is dying, as you mentioned, which is sad, and a lot in trouble. So there, you can prioritize which languages you want to attack uh, using, I'm sorry, this information um, there. So this is uh, on this side of the information. 682 institutional languages and, and 1,500 developing languages. So you can make political choices of how to, how to save these languages. So our goal is not to just save all of them, but well, well, yes. part of them. It's to save all of them, but you can rank which ones you save first. Okay. <laughs> Women and children first. <laughs> who, who is going to be the first one? Well, it would probably be whichever on the 682 are not in the list of 420 languages in Kurbadan. So, and then you can rank them by the number of people in the, in the you can okay. rank them. Okay, thank you. Adam? And, and also different to the um, to the web approach is um, work from Summer Institute of Linguistics, and we, we had a we had an insp uh, inspiring you know, to counter this depressive tone. We had an inspiring video from uh, Doug Higby from um, Summer Institute of Linguistics at Lexicon last year showing the, uh, um, a, uh, uh, an offline crowdsourcing, uh, you know, getting, getting people together, in, this was an African language of Mali or somewhere, um, in Ghana, yeah. in, 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 and getting, getting people together in a sort of real sense of party, showing how many words that we've found in the last week, um, and how many, how many you, know, uh, um, you know, can we reach our goal of 20,000, and they were reaching it with with, with sort of collective effort, with it being something that people did that was great fun in schools. And um, uh, uh, were, um, there's, a, there's a, a, a book by Ronald Moe, which, which in this tradition, which simply lists all the questions to ask to cover all the areas of voc vocabulary. You know, what sort of items, in the, let's move to the kitchen, what kinds of items do you use for cooking? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, once you ask the question, people pour out the equivalent, their equivalents for frying pan and, and skillet and hundreds of other words. So that was a very, um, that was, it was very nice to have that, which kind of shows a practical way to do all that stuff. Yes, so you're saying that there are methods that, that provide hope that this can be actually, these languages can be saved if there's just the will to implement them. Yeah, maybe a last question from there. Yes. Uh, yeah, I just wondered if, if you had any thoughts about the many Chinese languages which are spoken by lots of people, uh, mutually incomprehensible, but have, are identical in their written form. What, what can you do about them? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I talked talk to uh, our colleague here from China who says that th there's only Chinese, there's only Mandarin dictionaries pr produced in China. And so all yeah. the regional languages are not, there's no dictionaries for them because yeah. they all use the same word forms. Um, I, I, think I think they are dying out of pace, but very yes. large numbers of people speak yes. them. Yes. Uh, I haven't worked with Chinese because it's, it's hard to work with uh, because you have to segment it. and. And there are segmenters, but um, but the question is of what to do with Cantonese and Hong Kongese and uh, I don't know hundreds, hundreds of others as well. Eh? <laughs> Hopefully, they'll realize this soon in China, and they have the methods of making people do things there. So <laughs> once they get rid of air pollution in Beijing. Well, thank you very much Thanks. again. And, uh,